Right. Um, hello, everyone. First, thanks to the organizers for organizing this fantastic conference and having me here. And a special thanks to all the people behind the scene who make this all possible. Um, today, I will talk about how to use or how we use optically pumped magnetometers to detect nuclear magnetic resonance. And my special focus will to especially extend the field range of these kind of magnetometers. Um, I don't know how much you remember from your um, undergraduate chemistry classes, but the only thing I was remembering before I started um, doing, a Zulf, uh, doing a, an NMR PhD was that in NMR going to higher field strength is, is usually better. The reason is at high field strength we have very well established um, detection systems like induction coil and all the chemical information is um, well encoded into the chemical shift as well as the J-coupling. But, well, going to lower fields is not a very bad idea because a lot of interesting thing happens if you go to lower field. For example, that starts with intermolecular surface dynamic. That frequency usually start at a few megahertz and go down to kilohertz, as well as the crossover between the strong and the weak coupling, as well as low frequencies enable you to um, do nuclear magnetic resonance in metals, which is not possible with uh, very high frequencies because the penetration depth of metals is usually quite low. So nuclear magnetic resonance is a very low field, not a very new topic. Um, there are well-established works with, uh, that uses uh, squid detection. Um, re recently, or just a few decades ago, also um, OPMs uh, were able to do this. Um, I actually put the, put the right bar here because our OPMs actually um, have a more limitation than uh, OPMs that were presented in, on this workshop. But our aim is to um, extend the, the range of the OPMs to make it able to detect even nuclear magnetic resonance frequencies up to, let's say, 10 kilohertz. Why is that especially important? Um, the reason is, if you look at the available um, nuclear magnetic resonance setups, you see that there are a lot of them in the high frequency regime, and there are also some of them like, like field cycling um, setups that go down to like, 10 kilohertz. But the range between 10 kilohertz and let's say zero field or earth magnetic field is an area which is poorly, um, well there are not many, many setups that cover this range and our aim is to use optical pump magnetometers to detect nuclear magnetic resonance signals in this frequency range. Um, just to give you an outline of my talk, first I will start to, to give a very brief introduction to nuclear magnetic resonance using OPMs, then I will tell you how our nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer works, and in the end, I will um, present you some applications, um, how we can use that for nuclear relaxation as well as high resolution spectroscopy. Just to bring you all on the, on the same level, I will just give you a very brief introduction how our experiment works. So we start with some nuclear spins outside the magnetic shield. We polarize them using a two Tesla Halbach magnet, then they are transferred into the shield um, by, well, at either hydraulically or uh, mechanically, and in the end we will apply a field that introduces um, some nuclear spin precession, and we are able to detect that with our optical pump magnetometer, which tentative axis um, is heading into nuclear spin direction. All right, in reality, well, that isn't much more complicated when compared to this simple animation. I've just brought you a very, well, it shouldn't be that way, just, um, so what we're seeing here, we're just pressing a button, then we use a syringe to, to move the, the, the polarized nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, nuclear spins into the uh, Zul spectrometer, and then we apply the pulse, and just a few seconds later, we see a very beautiful free induction decay signal that can be used for, for uh, further analysis. Um, a typical spectrum um, looks like this. So, um, first you see the free induction decay here, we have a lot of noise here corresponding to well, 50 hertz noise and other noise sources. But if you take a closer look you see that this really corresponds to, to nuclear magnetic resonance frequency at about 26 hertz. If we zoom in we see that well, the line width is in the order of 130 millihertz, which is um, quite good for just tap water which we used here. Um, even in a single scan we get a signal to noise ratio in the order of 50. And um, if we think about what the magnetic field is that is produced um, by this polarization method, we expect it to be in the order of 10 picotesla. So we should be able, easily be able to detect that. 
Um, just for further details about the setup we're using, um, we have a tw three layer twin leaf shield with mu metal shielded. In the middle, there is our optically, uh, our vapor cell um, with about 5x5x8 five by five by millimeter uh, volume. Um, our magnetometer strategy is quite simple. So we use a, a CW pump laser that uh, polarizes the, uh, the, the rubidium spins in one direction, and then we just read out the, the optical rotation of a linear polarized probe beam. Um, I think that's were discussed a lot in this conference. Um, if we think about the Dacre resolution, so we wanted to reduce the 50 hertz noise as most as possible. So we're um, using very low powered um, electronics. Um, for this, we just use an Arduino with a 16 bit analog digital converter to, um, to monitor the data. And with that, uh, that not only has a very low power consumption, but it's also quite cheap, what we like. Um, with that simple setup, we were able to, um, to do quite a lot of things. For example, Michael Taylor showed on the post at the, at the second floor that this setup is able to, for example, to use um, to detect nuclear magnetic resonance inside a metallic container. So this is an aluminum container. Um, for that, we didn't use the, the shuttling or the hydraulic shuttling approach. Uh, we just uh, used a solenoid wrapped around the, um, wrapped around the container to pre-polarize the um, to pre-polarize the water um, with a magnetic field of about only 20 uh, millitesla, but that was able, that was good enough to detect the nuclear magnetic resonance signal at about 38 hertz. Um, I won't spend too much on that, but so the, the main topic of the talk is how to extend um, the magnetic field range that we are able to um, to investigate using nuclear magnetic resonance compared with optical pump magnetometers, and the main problem is that. For example, if you think about hydrogen, the, the most easiest system you can think of, um, hydrogen is the, the nuclear spin dominated system with a gyromagnetic ratio of only 42 hertz per microtesla. On the other hand, we have the rubidium spins that are electron um, spin not dominated, and therefore the gyromagnetic ratio is two orders of magnitude larger in the order of 7,000 hertz. If you are at zero field, that isn't a real issue because a zero field, both llama frequencies are zero. And if you look at what the typical noise floor of a magnetometer um, at a zero field condition looks like, we have very well sensitivity, at least up to 300 nanotesla, uh, 300 hertz. And that corresponds to, or at least uh, we should be able to, to do quite good NMR detection. We think about a signal that is in the order of 10 picotesla. The problem is if you think about, well, let's say 30 hertz looks like a good frequency to, to detect nuclear magnetic resonance. To, to get the, the hydrogen to, to oscillate at that frequency, you have to apply a magnetic field. And once you apply a field, um, the noise floor drastically changes. For example, only 30 hertz correspond to a thermal nanotesla uh, magnetic background field. And that shifts the, the resonance of the rubidium atoms to a frequency of about 2.1 kilohertz. In other words, once we were able to, or once we made the, the protons oscillate at 13 hertz, we are no longer sensitive to that frequency. And that is a real limitation if you just use a simple approach and want to go to much higher frequencies. Um, the solution for that is actually quite simple and um, it was invented, or there was a publication almost 15 years ago by, by Igor and Mike. Um, the idea is um, if both have a different gyromagnetic ratio, you maybe just need two different magnetic fields. And the idea is to, to have a very strong and very localized magnetic field only at the position where the nuclear samples are, or the nuclear spins are, and on the other hand, have a very weak magnetic field that is in resonance to the llama frequency um, of, the, of the nuclear spins. So how do you do that? Well, um, you can read in the paper um, published about in, in 2000, I guess, that that can be achieved by just putting a solenoid inside the magnetic shield. Um, so that's what we did actually. <laughs> we just put a solenoid, we just wind a solenoid, put it in the shield. Um, you have to be careful about, so there is a small stray field because it's not a perfect solenoid and it's not an infinite solenoid. There are some inaccuracies in the winding, so there will be a stray field that you have to take into account. The equation is, well, it's not linear, but it's not that difficult that we're not able to handle it. And with that, you can, you're able to, if you, um, if you have a smart, if you're smart and pick the right um, magnetic fields for both fields, um, you're able to bring both systems on resonance. 
So we did that, and that is actually a result. So what we see here for each data point, we measured the noise corresponding to the LAMA frequency of the present offset field. And if you only lose one field, we, well, quite fast regional regime where the signal to noise for a 10 picotesla field is quite bad. But if you use both fields, we, we see that, well, the first thing is our sensitivity doesn't seem to drop very much. We are still at the 10 femtotesla level. And this actually gives you some indication of what the improvement is. For 100 hertz, it's, well, at least, I think, two orders of magnitude. I guess for much higher frequencies, it's even better with that simple, with that simple solution. All right. Uh, you maybe think of um, putting an additional solenoid in the, in the magnetic shield would, pr uh, would produce or would create um, some additional noise. Um, we actually measured the noise um, characteristics with only one field and with both fields, and we didn't see much of a difference. So that call doesn't seem to produce much additional noise in the spectrometer. All right. So what can we do with that? Um, I showed you that we were able to measure a, um, nuclear magnetic resonance of water at 26 hertz. Um, we now did several measurements and came up to uh, nuclear magnetic resonance up to 3 kilohertz. That is especially important because um, if you think about what the, what the magnetic field strength of the off magnetic field is, it's on the order of 50 microtesla. So we're well covering the regime from the zero field up to the off magnetic field. And I heard that chemists are really excited about that. Um, there's another important an important measure, especially for nuclear magnetic spectroscopy, uh, for MR spectroscopy, and that is the line width. And we see that we have an increase in line width due to the gradient. Um, if you just plot the line width for each of the curve, we see that there's a slight increase of the line width. It is still below one hertz, but it's definitely there. Uh, we can correct it by applying additional gradients that will only slightly um, decrease the sensitivity of our magnetometer because it's, no, it's not so sensitive to gradients. And that can be exploited, or you can use that technique to do, for example, um, NMR relaxometry, which just uh, maps the T to start time um, of the, um, or the, the, the relaxation rate um, of, of some protons. We did this by just adding some uh, paramagnetic ion. For example, here we used um, mangan 2 plus ions. Um, we put it in the water as a salt, and we saw that the relaxation rate is drastically the difference. And in the future, we want to do the same with much more complicated. Um, systems. All right. Um, well, let's get back to, to spectroscopy. So we, we thought about doing some demonstration with a molecule called trifluoroethanol. Um, that's, it is a very simple system because it only has one, uh, one J-coupling constant, but it still has two different um, nuclei involved. Um, if you look at the high field spectrum, um, I won't go into much detail, but what you see is you see a group of peaks corresponding to the fluorine. Um, atom and you see a group of peaks corresponding to the hydrogen atom. Um, they are split by, um, by the J-coupling between the spins. And that is the high field spectrum. If you go to very low magnetic fields uh, called a zero field spectrum, you, see only, you will only see two peaks um, that are, uh, that are um, um, dominated by or defined by the J-coupling. And what now we want to do is we want to see well, actually, what happens in between, right? We want to see the, um, the transition between the low field spectrum and the high field spectrum. And with the spectrometer we have, we can actually do that at every frequency we want up to three kilohertz. So that is the first result I would like to, to present you. Um, we just ramped the field, go up to at least uh, 23 microtesla, and we clearly see how the transition between the low field and the high field spectrum evolves. So, we tried to compare that with some, some values in the literature, and we found a paper uh, published 10 years ago which used um, high-performance um, superconducting interference device to detect the signal. And I would like to especially focus on the spectrum at the, bot at the top here, which is recorded at 24 microtesla. Uh, what you don't see here is actually any splitting in, in, in the smaller peaks here. Compared to what we see, um, we can really dissolve, resolve the, the, the splitting due to um, the coupling um, with, the, with the low field Hamiltonian. All right, so just to summarize that, um, I showed you, well, in general, that we're able to do nuclear magnetic resonance up to th three kilohertz. Uh, we can use it for field dependent relaxation rates. We can do that for NMR metallic containers as well as the strong to weak coupling regime. 
In the future, we want to do that. Well, we may want to use some, some hyperpolarization to further enhance the signal, as well as magnetic resonance imaging. And of course, we want to do more complex spin systems. Um, just, just one more thing. If you think about really what's happening in magnetron, I think it's um, quite interesting. In total, we, we use magnetic fields that spread over 14 orders of magnitude to make these kind of experiments work. The highest field is a pre-polarization field of the, of the Halbach magnet. The slowest field is a noise floor of the magnetometer. And these fields are only separated by, well, a few centimeters and a few layers of mu metal shield. Um, that was really surprising when I thought it through. Um, recently, we discovered that solf does also mean swirl, and that's actually not that wrong, um, that also motivates that there is now a Zulf shampoo. So in the, t in the next talk, I, I promise that we will do a Zulf spectrum of Zulf. Um, <laughs> I especially like the first point here. I tried it, it didn't work. But <laughs> so, so I really want to highlight that this work um, was done in a, in, a, in a larger network, especially what I'd like to highlight that uh, Dimas Group and two of his students are colleagues of me who are working at especially the same topic, as well as Shimon Postelny's and also Fieri Lesko's Group in Ulm and Krakow are part of the network. And of course, also ICFU is part of that. And with that, I would like to thank the Hot Adams Group. Um, I would especially like to thank Morgan Mitchell, who's my uh, my supervisor, as well as Michael Taylor, who built at least 90% of the setup that I'm allowed to use. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward for your questions.